The scripture text this morning comes from Mark chapter 1. If you can turn there, Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1 to verse 13. Verse 1 and on, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the living animals, or he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. May God bless the reading of his word. As you can see from our text this morning, we have entered the New Testament. After nine months, we have finally arrived to the important parts of the Bible. I am kidding. <laughs> But there is some within our community that think that the Old Testament is sort of uh, preparation for the new. In one way it is, but in another way it is part of the story of God. Now, I'm grateful this morning that we can gather together in this sanctuary. And it's good to be back. Uh, and as we make the transition into uh, the New Testament, uh, this sermon is designed to help us to bridge uh, Malachi and the Old Testament to our present text today. And I've been debating uh, far too much time, because I didn't preach last week, far too much time, how to approach the sermon. So I, I landed on this simple structure of three statements. I, I hate, uh, not hate, but uh, I don't like preaching sermons with point one, point two, point three. but there are times for that. And then, you know, my favorite preacher is Thomas Keller, or Tim Keller. He does that all the time, and it works for him. So... Uh, I will do that uh, this morning, and there are statements made here that will help us to set the stage for the rest of the year as we hope to end the last Sunday of this year in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So I have three statements here this morning, three statements. Statement number one, uh, Jesus is more than his story. Jesus is more than his story. That's why the opening of gospel the, of Mark begins with the most important phrase of all of Scripture. So if you look at verse 1, and there we go. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ, perhaps the most important phrase in all of Scripture. Now, this is written in verse 1 as a thematic statement for Mark, and it's supposed to... Uh, describe what will occur as Mark has written in his gospel, but it could also serve as the thematic statement for the entire Bible. So if you have your Bible, it says the Holy Bible. That's the title. And it's conveying the sense that this is a very unique book. It is the Holy Bible. There's no other Holy Bibles. And then it is the Holy Bible. It's sacred. But this title describes this book. It doesn't tell you what's in it. So that if I were to replace the Holy Bible, the title, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think we would gain quite a bit because now I'm into the content of the book. This book is about the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible is sort of God's answer to someone asking God, God, tell me a little bit about yourself. 
And God says, look, if you really want to know something about my son, you need to know my son Jesus, because he is the spitting image of me. But in order to know Jesus, you need to know his story, a story that begins from the very beginning. Not the beginning of his life, but the beginning of the world. In other words, uh, the magnitude of a person determines how large his story will be. If you live a very thin life, you get a very thin biography. If you live a thick life, you get a thick biography. Now, I'm told that the longest biography in the world or in history is Winston Churchill, a towering figure in 20th century. Now, imagine the 20th century without Winston Churchill. It would be hard. I mean, he may have been the most important person in the 20th century. It takes 24 volumes to tell you about his life. The Apostle John says, I can do you one better. To tell you the story of Jesus would take so many books that I don't think the world could contain it. Take every word that has been written and apply it to the life of Jesus, and you will still fall short of trying to describe the richness of his life. And perhaps John exaggerating. I mean, pastors are known to exaggerate for rhetorical effect, but perhaps not. I mean, how many words would it take to tell you the story of Jesus? So this is why Mark opens the story of Jesus by looking uh, back to before he was born. And so if you look at uh, verse 2 and 3 that we read, Mark begins the story of John the Baptist. Right? John the Baptist is his sidekick, sort of his best man. But to understand John the Baptist, Mark says you have to go even further back to the days of Malachi. Behold, I sent my messenger before your face. He's talking about someone who will come and point to the one who is to come. But Malachi stands in a long tradition of prophets. So that uh, he prophesizes that someone like Elijah would come. In Mark, we learn that John the Baptist will play the role of Elijah. So in order to understand Malachi, you need to go back to the days of the king and the story of Elijah. But in order to understand this quote, it's not just Malachi and the kings. You also need to understand Isaiah because Isaiah in verse 3 and on is describing a journey in a desert where a Moses-like figure will take them from oppression into the promised land, a land that is described by Isaiah as replicating the Garden of Eden. In other words, it's a story that comes back to its beginning. In fact, Mark cites all the way back to Exodus chapter 23. Because uh, if you look at the beginning, it says, Behold, I send an angel, I send a messenger before you. Those are the exact words in Mark chapter 1, verse 2. I send an angel or messenger before you to guard you on the way to bring you back to the place that I prepared. In order to understand Jesus, you have to go all the way back to Exodus. But not just there. If you remember verse 13, it talks about the Spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness where he's tempted in the desert for 40 days, and then he's at rest with the animals. That image goes all the way back to Adam in the garden where he experiences shalom, where there is a state of peace between the animal world and Adam and Eve. In other words, in order to understand Jesus, you have to go back to a tale of a man and a woman who lived in paradise but who lost it by taking a bite out of a fruit. I mean, if you really want to be nitpicky to tell the story of Jesus, you have to hear about the story of Noah who was in a drunken stupor after the mother of all Katrinas hit the world. And then how can you forget Abraham trekking through the desert plains of Canaan and commanded to sacrifice his son? Or Moses leading his people to the promised land? Joshua circling Jericho and the walls falling down? Deborah, a woman who helps Israel to fight the war? Samson succumbing to a prostitute? To the faithfulness of Ruth who demonstrates what it means to experience the salvation of a kinsman redeemer? You cannot leave out Ruth. To Saul, who was more fearful of a man than God, to a king scheming in the middle of the night. How do I get out of this adulterous mess? Oh, I got it. I'm going to murder a man who will lay his down, life down for me. And then he gets up in the morning. He experiences the guilt. And then God comes and says, look, I'm going to turn your lineage into a royal dynasty. 
dynasty. I remember Minister Chris saying, sometimes you get far more than you ever deserve. How true is that? And then from King David, we have Solomon, whose glorious ascent is eagled by his devastating crash, to Ahab and Jezebel's backstabbing, to Jonah taking a personal retreat in the belly of a whale for three days, to Nehemiah laying bricks with one hand, holding a sword in another. What a picture of determination and faith in God. Perhaps John was right. Perhaps he wasn't exaggerating. It may take more than 24 volumes to tell you the good news about this person we call Jesus. You see, the story of Jesus is the story of God in a profound sense. I can show you God. I just have to show you Jesus. Because in one sense, seeing God is seeing Jesus. In fact, in Mark chapter 1, what we have here are two phrases uh, in the beginning, it says the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then right there in verse 14, the gospel of God. So that what we have is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of God being used synonymously by Mark. And what he's trying to tell you is that in order for you to understand the story of Jesus, you need to understand the story of God. How do you tell the story of God without going all the way back to the beginning? And then finishing to the very end. So this is why we spent nine months preaching about the Old Testament, because you can't start the story of Jesus with a virgin birth and a manger as though like he was beamed down, you know, like Star Trek, just beamed down right in the middle of human history. No, it's a history that starts way from the beginning in order for us to understand the richness of who he is. We have to start from the beginning. Throughout church history, Old Testament has played second fiddle to the New Testament, right? Behind every successful man is a faithful woman. <laughs> the Old Testament is like that faithful woman. You know, as a church, we have been dismissive of his teachings. Perhaps his chronological snobbery, you know, the new world always better. Perhaps his anti-Semitism, those Jews, I mean, they killed their Lord. We have a rich history in Christianity of that. Perhaps it's theological. Who wants the God of the Old Testament? He seems so petty and immoral. <laughs> Bipolar. No, just give me Jesus. There was a scholar in the second century by the name of Marcion who could be the poster child of this perspective. He put together the very first Bible. The very first Bible, Marcion put it together, and he didn't like the Old Testament. All, the, all those soap opera stories. I mean, remember the first time you ever read Judges? I mean, oh my God, this is in the Bible. And he didn't like it, and he didn't like the picture of God as well. And so what he did was he removed all 39 books of the Old Testament from his Bible. He only had two parts. First part, a truncated Mark, or a truncated Luke, and then just the writings of Paul. That was his entire Bible. I think or he put together Paul, I think partly because Paul could be read as condemning many of the Jewish rituals. Can you imagine doing reading through the Bible on that one? I think I would have no problems doing reading through the Bible on the Marcion Bible. Marcion treated the Old Testament somewhat like we do the manual for our cars. Right? I don't remember when the last time I looked at the manual for my car. Right? So we just bought a new car two months ago. We never looked at the manual. I know where it is. It's in the glove compartment, but it's as clean as the first day of class. It's sort of like the terms and conditions for Apple Play. Who in the world has the time? to read that. What do you do? You just check it off. And those in the spirit, that's what we do. We kind of like the Old Testament, yeah, that's part of the Bible. That's an errand, check, check. But it's sort of like the prologue to the New Testament. You know, it's okay if you have the time to read it. But the New Testament is where the story really begins. And I think Mark is saying, look, Jesus is more than a story. His story is God's story. Point number two. Jesus is more than my salvation. If you remember, we started this series in January by asking the question, why did Jesus die on the cross? And then we started in Genesis 1, and we're starting, we were making our way throughout Scripture. And that's the major question, why did Jesus die on the cross? Because there's nothing like the cross to symbolize what Christianity is about. You know, as a brand symbol, you can't beat it. So, you know, you're driving down the highway and you see the golden arches, you know McDonald's is coming up. You get a, a partially bitten apple and you know you're getting cutting-edge technology. 
you get that half smile with an arrow, and you're getting a package from Amazon. You get a cross, and you pretty much know the heart of what Christianity is about. The good news of Jesus is the cross. But in recent days, we have made the cross all about us. We have reduced the glory of God's work on the cross into a personal redemptive plan to keep us from hell. Insurance policy, sign off here, and you're guaranteed from the fires of hell. Now, don't misunderstand me. On one level, this is, of course, true. The cross is our hope of salvation from the wrath of God. Now, I hope you gain the sense that as we trace the Old Testament plot line, that there are moments when God gets angry, he will let it out, almost to the point of embarrassment, right? The flood, you have that, you have the Canaanite genocide. Uh, God can get very angry. And we have this uh, reduction of Christianity to, look, uh, God has a plan, a wonderful plan for your life, but sin has separated you. If you have faith, you can walk across that bridge from hell to heaven. But in our passage this morning, we catch glimpses of Jesus being more than about me. And I really want you to get this part. For 400 years, the Jews have not heard from God. No prophet has come and spoken. It's sort of like a divine, silent uh, treatment. And then God is waiting for the fullness of time before he begins the climactic push. John the Baptist arrives on the scene. The pieces start falling into place. And you're about to hit a major transition in salvation history. It's sort of like the fourth quarter, and then scholars have been debating about John's origin story. I mean, where did he come from? What was his theological view? What did he think about Rome? Uh, did he support the zealot movement? And Mark doesn't answer any of these questions. He comes out of the blue, and he's preaching a message. And the people hear him, and they see him, and they recognize immediately that He's the genuine prophet, and I was sharing with my wife this morning on the drive down here that I never noticed reading the Bible for 30-some years that John the Baptist never performed a miracle. He never performed a miracle, but the people understood that he was the real deal, that he was a true prophet of God. And there are two things you can say about John from Mark chapter 1. That Number one, he stands apart from the religious and cultural and economic institutions of the day. In other words, John wasn't corrupted by the system. Money doesn't influence his message. In fact, here's a man that is so focused on his message that he's living it out by wearing camel hair and eating locusts and honey for dinner. The second thing we can say about John is his association with the desert, wilderness. And this is crucial. John comes baptizing in the wilderness. The people have to go out into the wilderness in order to be baptized by him. Again, John the Baptist is connected to Elijah, and Elijah is associated with the desert. He is a prophet of the, des uh, of the desert. So that uh, when you hear of Elijah, you think of the desert. When you think of John the Baptist, who comes to play the role of Elijah, you think of the desert. And in fact, this section that we read ends with the desert. So uh, if, if you remember, uh, Jesus is led into the desert to be tempted for 40 days. In fact, if you look at John chapter 1, see, there, there, four times, wilderness, 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 wilderness in yellow, repetition on and on, and then in the green, camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist is an implication of the wilderness going back to Elijah. That's a lot of references to the desert. Why? To fully understand this, we have to think of the wilderness in the context of the Exodus, the most significant event in Israel's history. And then remember, this citation goes back to Exodus chapter 20, that God will send the messenger who will lead his people through the wilderness into the promised land. And this is Isaiah's message, that God is planning a second exodus, and it's far greater than the first exodus because it's not just from oppression from Egypt, but it's enslavement to the world, and it's not the promised land that they're going to, but it's the kingdom of God that has come. It's not about ethnic Israel, but it's about people from all tribes and all languages, and it's not Moses, it's Jesus, and it's not the blood of a lamb, but the blood of the Son of God. Exodus 
Isaiah is saying there is an exodus that is coming that is far greater than you have ever experienced or imagined. Yeah, Jesus is about our salvation. Through him we're born again, and I'm so thankful for that. But Jesus is about far more than that. He has come to reverse the tragic effects of Adam's fall on every level. See, we see this in the temptation account, because the imagery goes back to Adam and Eve experiencing shalom with the animals. And just as uh, the second Adam enters into the desert, to undo what the first Adam did. So look, notice the parallel. Adam and Eve, sons of God, unfaithful, paradise turns into a desert. Jesus, the son of God, faithful, goes into the desert, obeys God in order to turn the wilderness back into the promised land. In other words, Jesus has come to renew all things. It's not just about my salvation or yours. It's about the salvation of the whole world or the way that Paul put it, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not just about my sins, but the sins between people groups that have oppressed each other. It's about the refreshing of the land. No more war, no more drought, no more viruses. The imprisonment of Satan and his forces behind a wall. The world as it was originally meant to be. Now, just a quick aside, I, I, I've taught philosophy for 18 years, and, and every philosopher, while they disagreed on the solution, they all believed that there was something wrong with the world. Jesus came in order to reverse its effects. And so Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. The Jordan River is the gate of entrance into the Promised Land. It is here that Joshua divided the river into two, remember, so the Israelites can walk through into the promised land. Now, Jesus comes, and he's standing in the Jordan River. His name is the same as Joshua. It's the same name, same river. But instead of splitting the Jordan River into two, he splits heaven. So that if you look at Mark, 10, uh, Mark verse 110, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. Now, that's a very strange word. Generally, it's op uh, it, the heavens open, but here it's ripped apart. It's torn open and the spirit descending. Now, if you go back to Malachi, this image is that, look, God is saying, if you bring me your tithes, I will open the heavens, and the riches of heaven will flood down so that you will no longer have any need. And Jesus is standing in the Jordan River between the wilderness and the promised land. And when he comes out of the Jordan River in baptism, the heavens open up, and the imagery is that the riches of heaven will flow down onto earth and God will change and renew the world. In fact, if you look at this verse, it's going back to two passages. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Do you remember? The Spirit of God hovering over the water. Hovering is the image of a bird. Same here as a new world is being created. And then the second one is Noah with the flood, with the doves. See, all of these images is that God is finally here to make the world as it ought to be. But there is more. This renewal, this tearing open of heaven is because Jesus died on the cross. So that, uh, if you look at Mark chapter 15, verse 38, this is the end of the book. And the curtain of the temple was torn into. That's the same Greek word, right? The, the imagery here is that when Jesus died on the cross, that the, the curtain that kept us from the Holy of Holies was ripped open, and it's the same word that is used of heaven being ripped open in order for the blessings of God to be poured down upon us. Yes, Jesus is my personal salvation, but he's about so much more. He's not just creating a new me. He's creating a new heaven and a new earth. Third point, Jesus is more than divine. Now, I know that kind of sounds weird because we think of God as the highest being possible, but uh, he is more than divine. We see his uniqueness in the very first verse, the Son of God. It doesn't get too much clear, clear. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one that John the Baptist points to as the coming Messiah. 
when he comes out of the water, you see the heavens that are open. Jesus hears the affirmation, you are my beloved son whom I love. And then he goes into the desert. He successfully fiends off the temptations of Satan for 40 days. Now, no doubt, Jesus is unique. But there's a flip side to this, so that when you say that Jesus is the Son of God, you, what you also get is that the Son of God is a phrase that's used for human beings. So uh, the Son of Seth, Son of Adam, the Son of God, that's for Adam, and then for Israel, you are the sons of the Lord your God. In other words, it's very possible to read a double meaning, that the Son of God is not only Jesus as being divine, but that he is also the human Son of God. In fact, for Jesus to be tempted by Satan, he has to be human, right? Because God cannot be tempted. James says that God cannot be tempted. Yet in the wilderness, Jesus is tempted for 40 days. You cannot resolve this dilemma unless you believe that he is also human. That the humanness of Jesus allows him to experience the states of affairs that God cannot because he is far more. In fact, Jesus is also baptized. In fact, there, there's been a lot of discussion as to why he became baptized. You know, your baptism occurred if you were a Gentile and you wanted to Jew, join the Jewish community. You were baptized, and then you were baptized for cleansing if you were impure, neither of which fit, fit Jesus. And yet he was baptized in order to be identified as being one of us, that he was fully human flesh and blood. You know, in theology, we have this saying, Jesus is fully human, but not merely human, to distinguish him from all of us. I think we can apply this formula to Jesus on the divine side. Jesus was fully God, but not merely God. He was more than divine. Why? Because he was able to experience the joy of giving his life for someone he loves. To lay down one's life, there is no greater love. God cannot do that. A human being can. Jesus is more than divine. There's a parable written by the forgotten G.K. Chesterton. Everybody knows C.S. Lewis, but people don't usually remember G.K. Chesterton. He's one of the wittiest writers in Christianity in the 20th century. And to explain the beauty of the incarnation, he told this story. This is a parable that he made up. And he said, there was once a man who was living a totally apathetic life to spiritual things. He drank, ate, and uh, gave no thought to God. And then one day he died and he went to hell. Later on in heaven, one of his friends who missed him, he wanted to visit hell and see if there was any chance for him to get his friend out, to take him out. And so he went down and he pleaded with the powers there to open the gates that it might be open but the iron bars never budged. And then his priest made a downward journey and uh, gave, gave his best presentation. Please, I, this wasn't such a bad guy. And the time that he spent here in hell, it helped him to mature. So please, let him out. But the gates remained stubbornly closed. And then one day his mother came. She did not beg for his release. Instead, with a quiver in her voice, she said to Satan, let me in. And the gates of Hades swung open on all of its hinges. And this is what uh, G.K. Chesterton was saying, that the only way to set people from hell is through love. In fact, you know the Apostles' Creed, that Jesus descended into hell, that he joined us in our hell, flesh and blood. But it was his love that set us free. This is the good news that Mark is about and what the Bible is about. And so the next week we're going to look at two verses, verse 14 and 15. So think of this as part one. Part two, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Mark gives this to us in, in one sentence. Uh, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning as we got to the New Testament, as we make this transition. Lord, we pray that we would make it with the right heart and with the right frame of reference in order that we might understand what you have in store for us. Help us, Father, to grow deeper in our faith and that we might see how rich the person of Jesus Christ is. For we pray these things in Jesus' name.
you please rise and let's respond together with this song. Mm -hmm. 